Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Nuno Sevivas from Bragas, Portugal. Dr. Sevivas is an orthopedic surgeon at the Trofa Sorry Hospital Group and the Centro Hospital Medio Eva in Portugal, where he's responsible for the shoulder and elbow unit. He's also the clinical director of the Trofa Sorry Hospital Central in Portugal. Dr. Sevivas finished his residency at the Centro Hospital Andrew Doro Vaga in Portugal in 2010, then performed fellowships in Paris, Lisbon, and Nice. Additionally, in 2017, he finished his PhD at the School of Medicine at the University of Mignon with the subject Massive Rotator Cuff Tear Biological and Regenerative Approach. He's also Assistant Professor at the School of Medicine at the University of Mignon. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Nuno Sebivas from Bagas, Portugal. Over to you, Dr. Nuno. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It's, it's for me a great pleasure being here uh, with you, and I want to acknowledge this kind of invitation. So I will talk about rotator cuff tears and try to define what is an irreparable rotator cuff tear, uh, about the, the superior capsule reconstruction, and try to understand how it works. Uh, I will talk also about the use of the, the long arm of, of the biceps as a graft for, for the SCR and try at the end to uh, underline the most important points of this uh, conversation. The, the rotator cuff, the normal function of the rotator cuff muscles creates a concavity compression, a mechanism that imparts stability to the glenomeral joint and establishes a stable fulcrum uh, against which the deltoid can rotate the humeral head and elevate the arm. So the rotator cuff muscles are responsible for the dynamic stability of the shoulder. And when this balance is lost, as it happens in the in a massive rotator cuff tear and is not restored, the scenario can complicate with the installation of a static superior subluxation of the humeral head. And finally, at the end, uh, 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 an osteoarthritis. Clinically, this condition may be associated with a, a specific presentation, chronic pain, and also some characteristic functional impairments. Uh, structurally, the muscle tendinous unit is affected as a whole. It's not only a problem of the tendon. There are structural changes like myotendinous retraction, fatty infiltration, and atrophy of the muscle, then that will increase with time, and they are important prognostic factors of tendon healing and treatment outcomes. The first step usually is conservative, uh, trying to control the pain, and also with physiotherapy, try to restore a balanced shoulder. The deltoid rehabilitation programs have demonstrated that the stabilizing effect of recruiting the anterior deltoid was or could be sufficient to significantly improve the function and pain. This program is based in the kinematic patterns described by Burkert, where deltoid rehabilitation can transform an unstable pattern to a captured fulcrum kinematics pattern. And also, an important point here is that two points of support with the subscap anteriorly and the infraspinatus posteriorly, like a, a suspension bridge, like we can see here in, in, in the Porto City in my country, uh, uh, could be enough to allow a proper function of the rotator cuff. So, and this is also an important concept when doing surgical treatment of a rotator cuff tear performing, for example, a, a superior capsule reconstruction in an irreparable rotator cuff tear. Massive tears uh, are often resistant to non-op treatment. And in that case, surgery is advised. Some cases have lost, like we can see here in this video, the needed elasticity to achieve an anatomic repair and this is related to the prognostic factors that I have mentioned before. But indeed, most are current, currently repairable. Despite this, 
the prognosis is uh, in a lot of, of, of the times uh, uh, uncertain. We know that the, the, the first known cases of uh, rotator calf repair were reported by Codman in Boston one century ago with the, the first two known cases. From his description, we can infer that the tendons may not have been of good quality and the, the, the tendon, the supraspinatus, was retracted toward the glenoid in such a way that prevented an anatomic repair. He called this difficulty as, as a, 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 a repair at distance and probably nowadays we would interpret these two cases as massive and irreparable tears but at that time at the beginning of surgical treatment it was the only possibility to him to repair these two cases so <clears throat> when we aim to repair the rotator calf tear the objective is also to obtain an anatomical attention-free repair of the rotator calf tendons to the footprint trying to restore a strong connection between bone, tendon, and muscle. The reasons for failure of healing are most of times uh, related with tissue degeneration, reduced cellular activity, and decreased tendon healing uh, potential. Moreover, even when the tendon heals, there is no regeneration of the tendon bone interface. And we, don't do, we cannot achieve what we can see in this picture with the, the, the four zone transition of the tendon to the bone when uh, doing a, a rotator calf tendon repair. The first objective of my talk is try to define what is an irreparable rotator calf tear. It's not easy and somewhat arbitrary to define an irreparable tendon tear. Nevertheless, in the presence of a severe and fixed retraction of the muscle tendon tendinous unit, a grade three on the uh, classification system of PAT, or a severe calf muscle fat infiltration, a grade three or four on the Gutalier classification for the CAT scan or the Fuchs classification for the MRI, uh, or when we can observe a proximal humeral migration with a narrowing of the acromial humeral distance with less than six millimeter on the AP view in natural rotation, we can consider this tear as chronic and irreparable. But back to the beginning, when we have to treat these patients, we have two objectives. First of all, to relieve the pain, and then try to improve the function and also the strength. And if the tear is irreparable because it lost, it lost the, the elasticity or uh, the, the healing uh, likelihood is, is too low, what can we do for our patients? Well, there is a myriad of options trying to improve these patients. Uh, we have partial repairs, uh, subacromial debridements, biceps, long out of the biceps uh, uh, procedures like tenotomy or tenotesis, tendon transfers, and these two options, the, the, the reverse shoulder orthroplasty and the SCR are uh, two very reliable options uh, when treating these patients. <clears throat> the, air, the, the, the reverse shoulder orthroplasty uh, is based on the on the work of the Professor Gramont in the in Dijon in France, and we have to remember the sentence uh, about the the fact that the, when the patient has lost a function, he does not care about the design of the prosthesis that will be implanted on him. It, and uh, another thing is, it is useless to search for an anatomic solution if this very anatomic system will lead to a failure. So what is important is to obtain in these cases a functional surgery and the, the reverse shoulder arthroplasty can do that. We observed in, in these patients treated with reverse shoulder arthroplasty 
the, that this procedure can be can have uh, life changing improvements in pain, in function and motion. However, there is also a high number of complications, and it is not the most perfect solution. For example, in young patients. The superior capsular reconstruction appeared as a less invasive method to treat these irreparable tears. And evidence-based medicine, of course, is important to support our work. But for me, the mechanism-based medicine is even more important. So it is very important to understand the underlying pathological mechanisms that can help to support our rational of treatment. And this is the case in the development of this option to treat irreparable tears. As we can see here, the tendinous insertion of the infraspinatus expands more anteriorly than, than it was previously believed. Using anatomy and uh, histological analysis, we can divide the infraspinatus tendon in two components, the dorsal transverse fibers and the ventral obliqual fibers. And we can uh, observe also that uh, we have two layers of the rotator cuff. We have the deep layer that corresponds to the articular capsule mixed with the ventral obliqual fibers of the infraspinatus, while the superficial layer corresponds to the dorsal transverse fibers of the infraspinatus mixed with the fibers of the supraspinatus. So the posterior superior capsule is strongly related to the deep layer of the rotator cuff. And this is the basis for the development of the SCR treatment. It all started with Mihata's biomechanics cadaveric work with a graft attachment medially to the superior glenoid and laterally to the greater tuberosity. And he observed a restoration of the superior stability of the glenomeral joint using this approach. Later, the same author published the first clinical series results and he observed and defined this option as a reliable and useful treatment for irreparable tears. Here in my country, in Portugal, Clara Azevedo and Ana Catarina Angelo, they pushed a lot uh, on, on, with this approach for, uh, for these patients. And they also reported their results about donor site morbidity in, in the SCR using a minimally invasive harvest fascia lata autograft. They observed that the donor site uh, was satisfactory and the morbidity was not a valid argument against use the autograft of fascia lata. Here you can see a small video of the, the fascia lata harvest. Then <clears throat> we also have uh, some works of the same group of Clara uh, with uh, uh, 22 patients and with a, a medium term follow up of three years and a clinical and MRI uh, control of, these, uh, of all these patients. And uh, it was observed a significant improvement of pain, function, and clinical scores, but 20% uh, of the patients reported uh, donor site pain. And uh, it was observed also that the complete graft tears were correlated with decreased external rotation strength at the uh, RE2. And when, what is the best option between the, the, the reverse tool arthroplasty and the superior capsule reconstruction? Well, the answer is it depends on the patient. We have this work comparing the two options, the SCR and the, the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. It was a single institutional analysis, and they observed a similar value in short-term follow-up with an advantage 
for the reverse shoulder arthroplasty with a shorter operative time, but the SCR uh, had a lower complication rate. And how can we perform the, the, the superior capsular reconstruction? Which graft is the best option when we want to do an SCR? We can use autografts, alloc, xenografts, and there are some advantages and disadvantages in each of these options. The autograft has the advantage of histocompatibility and also uh, uh, it increases the healing uh, likelihood, but uh, it, it adds morbidity and also the surgical time is increased. The allograft uh, has the opposite uh, scenario less morbidity, decreased surgical time, but we have some issues about healing and also rejection or antigenic problems. And if we opt for the, for the autograft, there is other options uh, besides the, the, the fascia lata. There is any autograft in the neighborhood? Well, the long head of the biceps seems to be a good theoretical option when we want to do a reinforcement of the, the shoulder tissues like the, the, the superior capsule. But before doing that, we have to change something in our rational of, of thinking because until the, 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 the second decade of, of the 21st century, it was commonly believed in the field of shoulder surgery that the, the long head of the biceps tendon was a pain generator and consequently had to be routinely sacrificed. So if we want not to sacrifice the long head of the biceps, we have at the beginning, at first step, to accept that sometimes it is not related with pain and it's not uh, an accepted uh, concept even in, in, in nowadays. <clears throat> For example, I can I can I'm here to show you that when I was conducting some, some works in, in cell cultures, uh, for me, it was very easy to, 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 to obtain these, these uh, tendon samples from the, the LHB uh, uh, tendons that I had to, to resect in, in, in the patients who received a, a, a biceps sternal disease procedure. So in my, in my rational, uh, I have, oh, I had also the, the idea that the the, the long head of the biceps had to be sacrificed in almost every uh, uh, shoulder surgery, and maybe this fact is not correct. And with that step, maybe we can use the long head of the biceps to uh, support to 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 reinforce our work when we have to do a, a, a shoulder surgery. Uh, the LHB is in use uh, in which situations? Well, for the SCR, for the irreparable rotator cuff tears, and also to augment uh, poor uh, soft tissue qualities like the labrum, for example, uh, or for example, to, to obtain an, an, an amok effect in the, in the DAS procedure for the shoulder instability. So it, it's, its use is now very popular in different uh, approaches, in different surgeries, and also in the SCR. An immediate advantage of the use of the long head of the biceps is the fact that the one of the points of fixation uh, in, in the glenoid is already obtained because the, 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 the region of, of, the, of the tendon is in the supraglenoid tubercle and we don't have to, to obtain a fixation and a healing 
of the of the the tissue in the glenoid side. So we only have to fix to to obtain a fixation and healing of the graft in the the umbilical head, uh, and so with that we can decrease only with choosing this graft. We can decrease by half the likelihood of failure with our procedure. The, the techniques of the, the, the reconstruction of the superior capsule using the long head of the biceps can be divided in two big groups. Uh, one group of techniques using the biceps tendon as an autograft and another group uh, rerouting the biceps tendon, taking out the biceps tendon for, from the bicipital groove and uh, uh, making a, a, a different location of this of this tendon. We need to have a viable and locally available autograft. So we need to, to have a, 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 an intact long head of the biceps available to use uh, this graft for the, the SCR. Uh, <clears throat> when we use the long head of the biceps as an autograft, we observed in the reports that we can obtain a decrease of the superior translation of the humeral head, but did not restore the translation to native levels. We have some techniques, some different techniques uh, described for to obtain to obtain uh, the the effect of SCR with uh, LHB using the LHB as an autograft. Here we have the 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 snake, the triple bundle technique or the tendon box configuration described by, by Denard. We have also some uh, uh, short, medium-term uh, reports about its use, like with the, 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 the triple bundle technique with 53 shoulders with more than two years of follow-up, at least two years of follow-up. And the authors observed improved clinical and radiological outcomes with uh, almost or more or less three out of four patients achieved a 17 point improvement in the, oh, in other words, in the, in the minimally clinically important difference uh, in, in the last follow up with the ASIS, what, as, as a score and with good healing rates with 86% of healing rate in the MRI. We can see here in more detail how to, to perform this technique, the triple bundle technique, with a subpectoral tenodesis and use a big amount of the, the long out of the biceps tendon to perform this three passage between the glenoid and the humeral head. The rerouting of the LHB, it's, it's my preferred technique. We can obtain the effect of SCR without detachment of the LHBT from the superior liberal complex. Uh, we have to, to obtain fixation at the greater tuberosity to reduce the humeral head superior migration. We can do an optional tenodesis at the distal aspect of the lateral anchor. And it, in, this fact is very important. It's very, very important to uh, perform a side-to-side -side repair of the supraspinatus tendon and linking the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus with the long head of the biceps. We can see here <clears throat> a small video where we perform this technique with a completely, it is important to, to obtain a completely free long head of the bicep tendon from the groove. Then a new bicipital groove is shaped lateral to the native bicipital groove. Uh, we obtain a fixation of the long head of the biceps in the new groove. We can obtain, like in this case, 
with a, a, a knotless anchor or with, with, with a different method. The important is to obtain the fixation of the, the, the tendon in the new groove. And then at the end, we can use more anchors to uh, obtain a repair of the supraspinatus and link the supraspinatus to the long end of the biceps tendon. And also, it is very important to obtain at least a partial repair of the infraspinatus. Several authors observed improved clinical outcomes with a rotator cuff repair and heading to, to, this, to this repair uh, uh, along out of the biceps rerouting with low repair rates. There is any condition needed to perform this technique? Well, the most important, we need an intact and present long head of the biceps tendon. It seems like a, like a, a, a Lapalis uh, uh, sentence, but it is very important because like we can see here in, the, in this uh, series of, of Clara, in half, almost half of the patients of her series, uh, um, the long head of the biceps was absent. So, there was a, a, a previous tear of the long head of the biceps. So we have to know in advance if uh, it exists, this tendon, and be prepared for a, a plan B if the tendon is not on place. And you can see also in this fluxogram, that it is very important in our rationale of treatment to try to organize our options and using this important fact. The long head of the biceps tendon is intact or no, because this will have an impact in our, in our work. We have conducted also a, a systematic review <clears throat> about the, the, this technique of the superior capsule reconstruction with the long head of the biceps. And uh, we observed that the superior translation was significantly decreased. The subacromial peak pressure was also significantly decreased with a significant improvement of forward flexion, the, the visual analog scale, the, the pain, and also the clinical scores like the constant and other scores. Uh, <clears throat> uh, an important issue that we observed was the, the heterogeneity of the surgical technique. There are a lot of variations and this is a major limitation when uh, analyzing the effects of this uh, uh, procedure. And sometimes they are not really the same procedure. So, and this uh, inputs some uh, uh, difficulty to obtain uh, uh, an effect of, of this group of techniques. The main complications when uh, doing this technique were stiffness and also graft failure that was reported between 2 and 22%. An important thing is I want to remember, like it is uh, the case in, in other locations of our body, the autograft is still the gold standard. And uh, at least here in, our, in, in Europe, uh, we prefer to use autograft and not uh, uh, allograft. Another thing, the irreparable massive rotator cuff tears, they are very challenging. It's, it's very difficult to treat these, these patients, these injuries. And we have a myriad of open and arthroscopic techniques trying to uh, improve the, 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 the condition, the health status of our patients. 
the SCR with long out of the bicep tendon with the rerouting techniques or autograft can help. It is very important to remember that sometimes this tendon is not present and we may need a plan B. Uh, and this approach should be uh, uh, performed with a, a, a repair, at least a partial repair of the uh, rotator cuff. Biomechanically, <clears throat> we observe uh, partially or fully restoration of the native shoulder biomechanics. Uh, we observed improved shoulder function, uh, but we need, I, I, I said before that uh, it's important, evidence-based, but for me it's more important than the, the mechanism-based uh, medicine. However, we need to support our options, evidence-based recommendations, and uh, these uh, uh, results are missing and we need randomized controlled trials to, to, to have this knowledge to support, to support our work. And also the results should be reproducible. So the technique should be easy to perform and reproducible in different, uh, in different hands. Finally, it is an alternative for the treatment of irreparable massive tears, and it may improve the quality of life of the patients. And the last slide is about the Scott's parabola uh, to remind that it happens a lot of times, this, this, what we can see here in this parabola. At the beginning, uh, a promising idea, a new, a new approach, a new technique uh, seems uh, to be of possible value, but only as a research tool. Then we can observe encouraging reports. Uh, then there, there, there is an widespread enthusiasm with strong media pressure for universal acceptance with general introduction of the technique. And at the top, it is considered the standard treatment. But when we uh, enlarge the indications, we can uh, observe the negative effect of this. Doubt creeping in, damaging survey reported, sometimes some, some medical legal case is publicized and uh, the, the, the good technique of some days ago becomes condemned by, by the author, authorities and used only in highly specialized circumstances, circumstances and it can fall into disuse we have to remember this parabola in all our procedures trying to avoid this, this effect. We have to choose the right indication of treatment for the specific situation and choose the best graft for the technique and for the patient. E obrigado, which means thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sevivas, uh, for this enlightening presentation. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen, uh, Nuno. Yeah. Okay. No, this this PowerPoint is still there. You can close it. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sevivas, for this uh, enlightening presentation. And congratulations for your research paper as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sevivas, a few questions. Now, if there are significant inflammatory changes in the biceps tendon, do you think it can be still used? Because then it becomes a pain generator, right? Right. This is something important to... to to observe and in our the decision algorithm. It is not only the, the, the inflammatory changes, it is also what we observe sometimes, the, the partial tear of the tendon. If it is uh, more than 20%, and this number is not evidence-based, is a little bit empiric, but with more than 20%, it becomes weak and weak tendon. And so, in my opinion, if we have uh, inflammatory changes 
and more than 20% of partial tear, we cannot use this, this tendon, this graft. Thank you, Dr. Sevivas. And what is your preference when the biceps tendon is absent? For example, you mentioned uh, Clara's paper where 47% of cases, the biceps tendon is absent. So, And what is your preference in those cases? My preference is the, the, the fascia lata, of course. I've tried, like, like almost all the surgeons, the, the allograft because it seems very appealing to use something that uh, it, it will not add uh, any morbidity, but the results, I think, in my opinion, what I observe are not the same as when using an autograft. So we have to prepare the patient that we may need to use a fascia lata autograft if the LHP is not present. Thank you, Dr. Sevivas. Uh, we are also joined by Loy Al Khatib, uh, who is an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine uh, specialist from uh, Dubai. Uh, Loy, welcome to the show. Any questions to Dr. Sevivas, please? Uh, sure. Good evening. Good evening, guys. Thanks for a nice presentation. Interesting, interesting topic. So I think the trend now, everyone is want to jump on the biceps tendon and use it for the initial pathology. One, one question. Do you, are you aware of any study that compares the in space balloon versus uh, SCR using a long head of biceps tendon? Do you think they will provide similar results? And the same thing, I'm not sure how you can convince me in the in the rule of the biceps tendon when you reroot it uh, and will be able to depress the humeral head and prevent it from proximal subluxation? <clears throat> well, first, uh, super, uh, the, 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 the balloon has showed in recent, in recent studies that the, the results, they are not very reliable. And, uh, and I think also, if we look to the mechanism, it is not the same because we cannot uh, control how it will be the day after uh, putting the balloon in the in the in the subacromial space and compare the balloon with the SCR. I think they are not the same the same thing. Maybe theoretically they can they can be used in in similar patients but the effects are completely different. Uh, but I'm not very experienced with the balloon. Uh, before using it, I, I prefer to wait to see the, the results with time. And so uh, my personal experience with that is, is zero. I don't have experience with, with balloons. Um, uh, the other question uh, about the effect of the rerouting techniques. Uh, it is important uh, to add this new groove for 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 obtain uh, 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 a healing of of the tendon, a fixation of the tendon in the new position. I think this can uh, uh, this can be a point also to obtain uh, contact with the 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 infraspinatus tendon or the supraspinatus. And uh, it is a very this this technique of of using the the LHPT to to increase to improve the the healing of uh, the the tendons. Its use is is for many years. So and we can use this concept, but using also an essay to obtain a. a, a a depress uh, of, of the of the head. Mm -hmm. What well, technical wise, what do you do? Would you fix or do the tenodesis first, and then you cut the tendon after making a new groove? Or and the the other question: How far you go distally to mobilize the tendon? Till the 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 pec major. You have to you mobilize it all the way everything. everything. You have to free everything that is uh, uh, around the, the the LHPT. So you can go until the the beginning of of the pec major, and then with that you can do the 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 rerouting. Okay. So you 
you mobilize it all the way down to the pick major, then you do the new groove for it, you fix it, or you do the yeah. tenodesis, and then you cut the distal part of it, or you don't yeah. cut it. You don't have to cut it. You, you don't, don't okay. have to cut it. So how you, how you decide the optimal tension in that way? Uh, yeah, good question. The optimal tension is the tension needed, the minimal tension needed to put the tendon in the new groove. So you'll not be able to mobilize it more than, let's say, one centimeter, let's say, posterior. So your, your aim to make it just diagonal as close as, as much to the infraspinatus. Yeah. To act as a real head. I, I think your question is related. If it becomes too tension, it, it it can it can add some pain to the patient when exactly. doing but, um, flexion. Yeah. yeah. I I have not observed that, but it's like when we are doing uh, a tenodesis. For you, when, when you do a tenodesis, what is the important factors to to do not obtain an over tensioning? Of 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 the the tendon, do do you cut first the 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 tendon from the superglenoid tubercle, or do you prefer to keep in place, do the tenodesis and only after? Exactly, I I leave cut until the end, and see how it looks. Yeah, but but you can see also some some approaches. Uh, uh, Cutting first the tendon and trying to measure the the, the distance of tendon that you put inside inside the, the, the bone. Here you can do the same. Try to preserve the same distance to not overtension the 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 new place of the tendon. That's yeah exactly. This is that uh, so, so super tricky because you need to control the tension. And at the same time, you need to put the groove in an area that will ensure you a depressor effect on the humeral head. I think the studies, the upcoming studies, try to find out what is the optimal place to find to place the groove. Is it two anterior, two posterior, or middle? I'm excited to for the results. Yeah, yeah me, me too. And and more important. Do, it's a number or it's it's related to the to the anatomy of the patient that's an answer that uh, we try to control all the variables but sometimes it is <laughs> our intuition isn't it that's true one last one last thing to mention that i have learned during my fellowship this is not every irreparable cuff is massive and not every massive is repairable but yeah. when you when you try to reduce when you try to mobilize the supraspinatus infraspinatus the, the retracted tendon and reduce it back or bring it back to the humeral head, it is not a direct medial to lateral pull. Okay, so you need to give it an angle. That means from medial, let's say, from medial side to anterior lateral. That will might give you the maximum length of the tendon of the affected tendon so if you mm -hmm. pull from there just give it a straight pull from medial to lateral might be the tendon is short will not be, have a good reduction i would say okay this is irreparable but if you try to pull it in a different way give it an angle the, the tendon might be uh, reducible this is something that i have even though and this is very important, and also the way that that we have to 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 cut the adhesions. I don't use slides. I prefer to do all, all, only only on the on the deep surface of of uh, mm -hmm. the calf to free the, that space. But even though if if even if you are able to put the tendon in place, does not mean and and future a future healing of that tendon. And Absolutely. And, uh, even uh, partial healing, sorry for that. Is yeah. it even a partial healing still partial still acceptable? Healing. Yeah, yeah. And maybe in that case is that we know that biologically we'll have problems. In these cases, I think we have to to have something. I'm not uh, completely. Uh, I don't know if we have to use always the SCR. Maybe not. 
but we have to add something to increase the healing and to improve the, 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 the okay. results. Exactly. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a fruitful discussion. Uh, thanks, thank uh, Hetish. That's yeah. it. Thank you, Loy. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sevivas, for this uh, enlightening presentation. That's all the questions that we have for this session. And we really look forward to hosting you once again in the future. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. It was a great pleasure to meet you and also to discuss and learn because when we try to teach, we are always learning and it was a very good opportunity.